Welcome back, everyone, um, to our second panel, um, Building a Strong Union. Uh, my name is Chris Goff. I am moderating this panel. I was a member of the GTF F from 2001 to 2006. I served as the Vice President of Organizing from 2003, 2002 to 2003, and then President from 2003 to 2004. I was a Benefits Administrator from 2006 to 2007, and I currently work for the American Federation of Teachers in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm the Assistant Director of the Higher Education Division there, um, have been there since 2007. Um, First of all, I wanted to thank the organizing committee for putting this event together. Um, I remember actually Dave and I working on the 30th anniversary event, and so actually digging into the history and kind of seeing about the uh, founding documents and then seeing the people who are responsible for that is a very kind of cool um, <laughs> moment for me um, to be here. Um, also, I used to make a joke about being a grad union president is um, kind of the loneliest thing ever because, you know, two years later and everyone who is, you know, voted for you in office is gone and no one remembers who you are. And then I actually got the invitation for this event the day that the Janus decision came down, um, which was a really bad day. And then to have it's like, oh, they remembered me. It was a really important moment. Um, so thank you for that. That was a very dark day for me. <laughs> um, it's really a joy to be here. Um, and it's also a joy to see you know, such an important part of my life being continued um, by an amazing group of activists um, carrying it forward. Um, just by way of kind of setting up our panel, and then I will turn it over to our panelists. Um, you know, the GTFF fundamentally is relationships. Um, relationships between coworkers, between friends. Um, but on top of that, you have this sediment built. You have all these questions. Why do we have so many people on our e-board? You know, where do these bizarre bylaws come from? What the heck is this contract article? Um, and that's the story of this union, the institutionalization of all these relationships that have happened over the year and accumulated. Um, and I think that we're coming into a particularly cool part of the story um, that started shortly before I arrived um, on campus um, that marks the GTFF kind of at the time, the social movements literature was full of discussions about business model unionism versus organizing model unionism or social movement unionism, um, and the GTFF beginning to make that turn towards that. And I think the story that we're gonna be told here is the GTFF becoming a more member-driven union, um, but also becoming a really kind of inclusive and really forward-thinking social justice union, um, where you know not only were we concerned about the working conditions um, on campus for GTFs, but we are also talking about, you know, the world that we lived in and how we can use our union not only to make our work better, um, but to make our communities better, um, to make higher education better, really to kind of think of leveraging our power, not only with the contract, but levering it, leveraging it to become a force um, for social justice in our communities. Um, I will end my comments by just remembering back in the day being told um, that we were the future of the labor movement and being really pissed off about that because I was a labor activist right then and there. Um, and so I wanna reiterate that. It's really cool that so many grad union activists move on to bigger things in the labor movement, but you all are the labor movement right now. You are actually leading the labor movement in many ways that I don't think people understand um, that are older. Um, but you are having a profound impact, not only in higher education, but on the labor movement in general. Um, and so with that, we are gonna go chronologically here. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Dave Cecil, who is current, well, I'll let you introduce yourself, Dave. So if you wanna grab a microphone so you can talk into it. Right. <laughs> I think that makes me the oldest person then. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, came, I joined the GTFF in 1999 when I came here for uh, graduate studies in history. Uh, I joined at the history department orientation. Cards are being passed out. I, I don't think I knew that the UO had a union. I was very excited to join it. My dad was a union man here in Springfield, uh, went out on strike in 88. Uh, I know that uh, Eugene Springfield Solidarity Network and the work that Margaret Halleck and others did um, there to support my dad's strike meant a lot to us. So I was very excited to join a union and be a union man. Um, I bought a t-shirt um, from the GTFF right away. They, they charged $10 at the time. Um, uh, I was very happy to do that. Uh, not a lot of people wore GTFF shirts. We'll talk more about why everybody does now. Um, um, uh, so that's where the, uh, oh, I guess I, I to, to say a little bit more about me rather than GTFF. I, I, I quickly became the treasurer of the GTFF. Uh, the person who was actually elected to be the treasurer decided not to do it, and the person who lost the election to be the treasurer stepped in, um, as is also a little bit of a tradition in the grad union movement. Um, I became the president of the GTFF. Um, 
uh, and had to leave the presidency uh, before my term was up because I thought I was going to be leaving graduate school, um, and then I ended up staying. So uh, my, my friend Ash Fogel, who stepped in for me, refers to herself as the uh, Jerry Ford of the GTFF to my Richard Nixon of the GTFF. Um, um, and then when I did stay in graduate school, I, I became the e-council chair. So I was a steward, and then I, I chaired the executive council. Uh, and then... Um, uh, realizing a year later that my decision to leave graduate school was probably the right one. Um, I um, uh, was leaving graduate school at the same time the GTFF had an opening for the treasurer, so I, I called them up. Um, uh, I remember doing it from my car driving, but we didn't have cell phones then. So, um, 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 uh, But I called them up and said, did anybody apply for that job? Uh, Lisa Hamilton, who worked there for a long time as the benefits administrator, uh, was like, we have three people and they all suck. And so I was like, do you think they'd hire me? And she's like, yes. And I was like, great. And um, they did. So uh, I went on to work as the staff organizer at the GTFF for another 10 years. Um, so uh, I wanted to say uh, also that I wanted to thank the, the founding people and thanks for coming out and talking with us. Um, I'm sure that you, from your conversations, and then this is how it works, um, put a lot into the GTFF and love it and love the people you work with. And we all feel the same way. Um, so many of us love the union and being part of it. So um, anyway, and I also wanted to say that I helped found the faculty union here on campus a few years back. I helped organize them. They, they have an office across the hall from the old GTFF office. So it was very convenient for me to be hired for a year to work for them. Um, and uh, the people who we talked to and were immediately said they would join a faculty union were the ex-grads, both of the GTFF, the GEO at Michigan, the TAA at Wisconsin, um, Amherst at the UAW. Those people are like, of course I join a faculty union. Why don't we have a faculty union? And so I can say with some uh, authority that without the GTFF, there would not be a faculty union on campus. I, I know that the GTFF grew out of a failed movement for a faculty union, and um, it, it came around 30 years later or so. At least Jerry gave a look. That's the narrative that Dan Pope tells. Um, 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 uh, um. So, uh, so in addition to uh, the, the GTFF in the fall of 1999 had just gone through a run of activists taking uh, control of the union, making it a member-run union. Uh, President Paul Pru here had been a longtime activist. People before him, um, I came into a situation where there was a very much a spirit of, of the members need to run this union and really take responsibility for organizing and everything. And they were beginning to do that. Um, it was a smaller union than it became, though, in the sense that our general membership meetings were in the basement of Pegasus. Um, so there were 40 or 50 people at a general membership meeting. Um, uh, we had no full-time staff. We had a couple few part-time staff at the GTFF, but no full-time organizer. Um, and, um, uh, um, uh, and at the point in time that I came in, I, I think that we were saying that 62% uh, membership. We had had 62% membership a couple years before I came in, um, and that was the all-time high. Uh, in a grad union, um, you know, the memories are short, so everything is the first time ever or all-time high, and you don't know, but it doesn't matter. It's it's about it's about celebrating yourself, not 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 documenting a historical record. So, um, 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 so although this is going to be on tape, so I'm going to establish what the all-time high was, Marchman. Um, 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 so. Uh, as I said, I came in as staff in, in 2002, and one of the first things that we did, um, Chris was the uh, organizer at the time. I hadn't met him when they hired me yet, um, but one of the first things we did is you all are now very familiar, at least the, 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 the current members, with the GTFF runs the health insurance program. When they bargained it in the mid-90s, at least this is the way it was told to me, the U of O was like, we will, we will pay for regular, real employee health insurance through a company, but we're not going to administrate this plan. And the union said, we'll do it. And, and that was a real boon um, because... As, as the people here now know, every new graduate employee on campus has to come to the office to sign up for health insurance. 
Um, and what they weren't doing, or at least weren't doing very much of before Goff and I were there, was using that as an opportunity to talk to people about union membership. Um, uh, and it's not because they, they, they just had a different, you know, they wanted to go out to the offices, they wanted, to, they wanted their stewards talking to people, um, which is a, obviously a very legitimate way of organizing a union, but we kind of said to ourselves, here's an opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with every graduate employee, let's use it. Um, and so we started doing that. Um, at first, we would do it after health insurance, and then after about a year, we realized that after people had signed up for the reason they wanted to be there, they didn't really want to hear any more. They wanted to leave the office. So we switched it to before the health insurance, which was a stroke of genius. Um, um, and so uh, what our theory was at the time was that we will get people to sign up for unionism. And it, it is a very shallow unionism if you just sign a card in order to get health insurance and to get a free t-shirt um, uh, but that will give us the opportunity to communicate with them they're gonna get union messages they're gonna get union mailings they're gonna have their stewards can come around and say you joined the union now it's time to get active there's a general membership meeting there's all kinds of things to do so we signed up people for health insurance so the numbers quickly climbed I think that first year we had 75% membership ultimately we hit 82% plus uh, membership um, uh, which was great um, 83% membership. <laughs> we were shooting for 82 because the, the, the people at, at GEO Michigan always bragged about 80% membership. And, and I know Goff and I wanted to, you know, that friendly competition to, to, to beat them. And then we found out that their 80% membership was 80% of the people we've talked to have joined the union. It's like, that doesn't count. That's not a thing. Um, so we, we far exceeded uh, the, the bill, and we were, we were pretty happy about that. Um, but Michigan actually, and I was going to say Michigan and TAA, were, were helpful for us in what we were doing for organizing. Because uh, AFT had founded a group called Agile, the Alliance of graduate employee locals not long before we came into the union movement um, and we started going to those conferences so those are twice a year conferences of all the graduate employee locals and uh, people from AFT and, 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 and in the general would talk about the big unions or the older unions the GEO in Michigan and TAA in Wisconsin and we would <laughs> we would have a little Oregon inferiority complex with the hey what about us we're old relatively large um, and so really born out of this kind of idea of like, uh, we want people to notice what we're doing. We're doing things on our campus that are good and, and, and um, what can we be doing? <laughs> um, um, at, in Agile at the time, there was a real strong um, culture of the organizing model is the only way to organize. You have to go out and you have to knock on doors and you have to talk with someone for half an hour before you even mention the union because you have to get to know them and their issues, which is a perfectly fine model. But it was not what we were doing. We were, we were having people sign up for health insurance in the office and having a brief conversation. And so we were doing things wrong um, and we didn't like we didn't like the idea that we were doing things wrong so chris and i especially but also uh, people like Courtney Smith and Nick Lugie and other names that will mean almost nothing to you all, but mean a lot to me. Um, spent hours after we would go to these conferences and like a good grad conference, it ends in a giant, you know, every night is a beer party, right? And beer and whiskey and other things that I won't mention. Um, and um, the parties would break up at one or two and then we would go back to our hotel room or our, our whatever house we were staying at and stay up until five talking. What did we learn today? What were other unions doing that we could do? What are unions doing that we don't think is a very good thing? Um, a lot of union reps in the grad union would come and they would talk at these conferences about how the administration was horrible and they were, membership was declining and no one wanted to join and they lost a grievance. I think one of the real things that we talked a lot about was we want to be positive. We want to talk about the things that we are doing well. Of course, things are not going all 100% right, but we want to go to these conferences and we want to go back to our local and talk about the things that are working um, and are being successful. And we, we tried our best to build a culture in the GTFF of a real belief in the GTFF, a real belief that... Um, the, we had things, we were doing things that were very positive on campus and positive for the graduate employees, uh, the GTFs at the time. We, one of the things that we try to do, and it capitalizes on what, what the founders were talking about, is 
we recognized that what the GTFF could provide graduate employees and grad and GTFs was um, a social outlet, a way to meet people outside of your department, a way to talk with people who are also going through the same miserable experience that you're going through, um, but aren't yet bored of your stories. Um, 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 and, and could, and so what we, we organized a lot around the social aspect. I think we became slightly known, um, maybe a little bit too much for our, our beer drinking. Um, um, we, we, we thought that grads like beer, we should provide them with lots of beer. Um, um, and we did our general membership meetings, um, <laughs> Dan was there a lot. Um, um, when I asked one of our, a couple of our activists, because uh, when, when the GTFF was putting together this timeline chart that Larissa is looking at, I asked some of the people we went, I, in my generation, what could we put on the back of the shirt? What did we do? And uh, our friend Wes was like, we could talk about the time we kicked that keg of Tricera hops before the meeting started. Um, um, and that's a 10% that's a beer. Um, um, so um, they, were, uh, they were beery. But at the same time, we were, what we were doing was having social events. Our officers were all trained ahead of time to know that their job was to talk to people get to know them, who are they, where are they, what are their interests, all that organizing conversations that, that classically is done in an office in a non-Rennies-based um, situation, but um, um, uh, can be done there. And our officers were also trained that the purpose of the, the, the event, the party, the, the, the general membership meeting, the hikes, whatever it was, was not to talk to people about the GTFF. What we didn't want to do was have a situation where people felt like they were invited out to a bar event and it was really a union member recruitment event. Um, that it was really a, now that you're here drinking this beer, you need to become a steward. But we would remember their names, we would remember where they're from, we would remember their issues, and then later when some, we needed a steward in math, we'd go, oh yeah, that guy showed up at that thing and he seemed all right and um, let's go talk to him about being a steward. So we tried to base things around there. We also tried to create a real identity of the GTFF on campus and normalize it. Um, one of the things that we thought was that we were able to do the department orientations, which I think you, you all still do. And um, what we didn't want to do is walk into those department orientations and say the first thing to these new grad students, many of whom had been rejected by every other university but Oregon, uh, sometimes a school of last resort for a lot of people, um, or the best, uh, best school. And what we didn't want to do is walk into the room and say, you know who sucks? The people who put you in graduate school. Um, these are your enemies. You hate these people. Because they're going to go, no, they don't. They let me into graduate school. They let me teach a class. They're paying me to teach a class. Um, um, and it's, it's very exciting. So what we came in and said was, you know, we are the GTFF. Here's what we do. We do some social stuff. We bargain a contract. You need to come up, sign up for your health care. And then the shirts, as I mentioned earlier, we were like, let's give away um, shirts. Um, let's have them all over campus. Let's have everybody wearing a shirt or a hat or anything to say the GTFF is a regular part of campus. It is something that every graduate employee does is join the union um, and then hook them into this is why we have a union. These are the fights we have. These are the reasons why we battle. Um, I just want to mention a couple other things um, since I've been given the sign appropriately. Um, uh, grievances were brought up earlier, and, and uh, I think that one of the great things we did, and there was a real spike in membership after we did it too, we were kind of frightened of it. We filed 53 grievances at the same time. Um, um, uh, all of the graduate duties and responsibility statements were out of compliance with the CBA, filed grievances over them, but we also put on the wall outside of the union office that we had done that. And so we put them, I think they were on yellow paper, and then when we won them, we turned them green, and when we lost them, we turned them red, but they were on the wall in the office outside. And we were a little frightened that people would come in and go, ooh, these guys filed grievances, <laughs> um, um, and, and they did, and they liked it. Um, and, and that was a big moment for us, because it was also the first signal to the university that maybe we were um, uh, angry at them. Um, the second thing that we did is, um, uh, since we were talking about the social justice, and Chris brought it up, I thought that we would, I would mention a few things. Um, 
the GTFF was the second union in the country behind the uh, city workers in San Francisco who uh, got transgender protections in the contract, protections for gender identity expression. And um, Ash Fogel and Krista Orth did a lot of work on that. And um, it was a big thing for us because the university, you know, fought and fought and fought and said, you don't need that, you don't need that, you don't need that. Now, of course, the university brags about their protections. So, um, um, and... Um, the other thing that we did that as a thing was the great cover up. Um, uh, and that was to raise money for Food for Lane County. Um, the idea behind it was both let's get together and have a great time and have a, a beer party. But um, also, um, the, the idea behind it was um, as graduate employees, yes, we are exploited labor. Yes, we are underpaid. Yes, we uh, need better health insurance. Um, but at the same time, we occupy a privileged place in our society. And there are a lot of people in the society that are much worse off than we are in graduate school and um, did not have the options we had. So let's do something to try to engage with the larger community. Um, and the same way we fought for Westmoreland student housing um, that when they shut it down, um, we caused a bit of a problem. It still got shut down. Um, the history of labor movement is a history of labor, labor fights, not wins. Um, um, and so, um, but that was another uh, area where we reached out and engaged with the community. Um, and then lastly, I, I will wrap up by saying that, um, uh, because I wrote it in big letters here and I didn't get a chance to say it. Uh, um, Lisa Hamilton, who I, I referenced earlier as the benefits administrator, probably did more than anyone else um, in the 10 years that she worked at the GTFF to sign people up for health insurance. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, throw her name out there as someone who um, uh, wasn't paid to be a union organizer in any way whatsoever, but was probably one of our best. So. Um, so I'll just tell you who I am and then I'll share, I'll elaborate on what Dave just spoke about because I was active during the majority of that time um, that he was talking about. Uh, so I'm Libby Shaney and I was a graduate student here from 2003 to 2011. Um, I was in the physics department and I, I now live up in Seattle and I work at a community college there and I am active in another AFT local up there, so I managed to get myself involved. And actually, in general, I've taken a lot of what I learned about the union movement and the union work and how to be effective about it. And I've seen a lot of places where our local up there can use some help. And so very different situations, different circumstances, but you know, I think there's lots of ways that some of what was worked for the GTFF could be used better like where I am now. So I use, I pull on that experience a lot, actually. Um, and was there anything else I should say about myself? I don't know. Um, what was your role in the Oh, my role, that's okay. probably important. Um, so I start off, I didn't know anything about union members, unions in general. I'd never learned it in school or anything, and I showed up at graduate school, and I knew it was a good thing to sign, so I'd signed it, but um, I really didn't know anything about what a union was or what it did. But as I started to go, I'd go to the meetings, because I would do something fun on Friday night, get some beer, there's some pol politics going on, and you know, we'd be like endorsing candidates, and I was like, this is kind of fun. Um, so I started to get more involved, and um, I learned a lot, and I basically did GGF, was the, where I learned about union work and the benefits and why it's so important for our society. So I can, you can credit someone who knew nothing about unions, and the GTF turned me into a complete union advocate. Um, and, I, so I became a steward for the physics department, did that for a little bit, and then I became the vice president of operations for two years on the board. So I was organizing all the parties. This is the person who, I don't know if she's here right now, said that yeah, last night. I, I organized the parties, and I was like, yeah, so I used to do <laughs> um, So I did that, and then I was the president for a year um, before graduating and moving on. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much my thing. And I, like Dave was saying, it was kind of a, a time when our membership was strong and we had a lot of, um, we weren't having big big fights or anything with the administration. Um, we had membership uh, above 90% the majority of that time when we were there. So it was hang out around 91, 92. Um, I, yeah. Go on. <laughs> okay. So so we were doing pretty pretty good on that front. Um, of course, you know, Janice makes that a different story now, but um, and we had lots of bargaining successes during that time, I would say. Like, we didn't have 
there wasn't a lot of animosity between us and the, the university. Um, bargaining, you could say, people almost looked forward to it a little bit. Um, not in the... It's like they knew we would come, we would negotiate, we would end up somewhere in the middle, and then there was kind of a fun around doing that dance back and forth. Um, I would say it was a very amicable relationship, um, almost enjoyable, and, and we had successes. We did things like reducing student fees almost to nothing. We put the first, we removed the cap from the health care insurance, so I don't know if that came up at all, but we had like a $100,000 cap, and people would just get cut off. Um, which that sounded like a whole lot until you had like a premature kid or um, cancer or something, right? And so, Pete, and then the costs of healthcare program. So that was a big deal. So we had some really big um, wins bargaining wise during that time, and it wasn't even contentious, I would say, either. So it was pretty, um, pretty amazing. Uh, so I participated on some of those bargaining teams. And and I just can second kind of what Dave was saying, this idea of organizing people around social opportunities. So you have a bunch of people who are, you know, a graduate school is a rough experience generally. It's not necessarily the most, um, like, confidence-building, inspiring experience <laughs> for everyone. And so, you know, it was an opportunity to go out and meet people, different people um, who had a commonality beyond just that you were studying the same thing in school. So it had a lot of opportunities. So the membership meetings, like... He was talking about, you know, we had people, often 150 people plus coming to those things. Um, so we had lots of things. We'd go, go through one, sometimes two kegs. Uh, <laughs> what he didn't mention was that Triceratops keg was one of two that got finished yeah, yeah. that night. That was when we decided that the second one wouldn't get tapped. After, no, no, I think we just decided we'd never get Tricera hops again. <laughs> yeah, I think that was the, yeah. the moral of that one. Um, so, yeah, we had some fun. We started doing the end-of-term parties, which I don't know if you guys still do that. Um, so that was something we started during that time was why not, at the end of the quarter, when everyone's done, celebrate their hard work and throw a little party and buy about $700 worth of food and drinks on the union. And it's pretty hard for people not to... Um, to complain, to say like, oh, I don't want to pay money when you have a lot of opportunities to come in and see what that money is paying for, you know, getting something out of it. Um, so we, that was the great cover up, as they mentioned, which wasn't even, it was for charity and we didn't provide free beer didn't. during that, that we all paid for our own beer. Yet. <laughs> um, still, still they, we had like tremendous, I mean, the bar was just filled with people. Like when we first started this, it was pretty amazing. Um, we also did things like like he was talking about attending Agile. Um, we took giant contingents to the AFT Oregon convention every year. Um, so that was like a big part of our organizing strategy because people, you could sign someone up who's a steward who maybe just comes to meetings every once in a while and then they could feel a lot more plugged in after going to that. And then they'd want to get more involved, like maybe serve on the board in some way after that. Um, so, and then we always had this tremendous presence at the convention instead of just like one person voting for our whole local. We had a team, we'd all be in our shirts, you know, people people knew us. Um, and it was it was fun because, again, you'd go out and drink at the end of the night. So who doesn't want to spend a weekend at Sun River on the union doing some, you know, politicking? And so anyways, it was, it, it was good. And we were involved in, in beyond just the GTFF. We were involved in the state movement. We were involved with what was going on at, at those levels too um, and across the country with Agile. So overall, I just think it was, it was a it was a good time for our union. We had strong membership. We had lots of bargaining successes. Um, we really, I think, took that social model and really built it up to probably about as good as it could get. Um, yeah, just a good time. And I guess, yeah. And then crazy stuff started happening near the end. But um, I was on my way out, so I just kind of was like, you have fun with Keith Appleby. Um, you got to mention yeah. <laughs> so hi, my name is Shauna Meehan, and I recently graduated from with my PhD in political science, so yay, I'm done. <laughs> um, and I came on right after you left. I started in 2012. Um, and uh, oh yeah, I guess I'm, per I'm currently an adjunct at PSU, but I'm going to be an adjunct, he adjunct here in winter and spring term, so yay for the adjunct life. Um, I will be join, joining UA when I get down here, so I'm about it. 
Um, so I was super involved with the GTFF for my whole time here. I grew up in a Teamster household. I had the Jimmy Hoffa Junior Scholarship for college. Um, hardcore union girl for, for our life. Um, and so from my time here, I just immediately joined the union. Um, Lisa signed me up. <laughs> I uh, was the chair of the Women's Caucus first, and then in my second year, um, I started on the infamous bargaining team, which I will talk about in just a minute. Um, and then I was the VP of Grievances, and then I was the president. So I, I've been involved here for a long time. My little mini me over here, Mike McGee, the current president, is you know just me two years later. <laughs> All the same things. <laughs> um, but my time uh, in the GTFF is absolutely the best thing I did at Oregon. Bar none, forget the PhD, the GTFF <laughs> was the best part. Um, so I've been asked to speak about the strike and the process that led to it. Um, so I will start by saying that we were pretty naive in the beginning of the process. Um, we were coming off of this amazing era that these two people have been talking about, super well organized, people came to GMMs like there were, you know, parties, people were super excited. We were organized across every department, across, um, you know, the, the physical sciences and the social sciences and everybody in between. And so we were just like, hey, this will be easy. Everybody loves us. This will be great. Um, and we didn't expect it to be super easy, but we did expect it to sort of run the normal course. Um, and the first part of bargaining went well. And then, of course, we ran up against issues of, not surprisingly, wages and medical and family leave were our big issues that year. So at the time, we were the lowest paid of all of the university's own comparator universities. Um, their own list, we were at the bottom for em graduate employees. Um, and similarly, the financial aid office's own estimate of what it costs to live in Eugene was approximately $150 more than a .49 full-time G GTF would be making at the time. So we were like, we ha your evidence tells us that you'd owe us a raise. Um, and at the same time, we didn't have any sort of mechanism for sick time um, or family leave. And this has always been a problem, obviously, but at the time of that particular bargaining cycle, we had a series of several GTFs who'd been hit by cars um, and a couple of really serious, um, difficult pregnancies and births that had led to people needing to take lots of time off and having no way to pay for it or no way to get the time off at all. Um, and we had one really horrible case of a woman who went through a very, very difficult birth and went back to teach. She, the birth on, was on Saturday and she taught Monday morning. Um, it was awful. So these are the stories that we took the administration when we were begging for some sort of economic relief in the form of raises and physical and emotional relief in the form of family and medical leave issues which they, of course, rejected out of hand. Um, so as I mentioned, we were a little naive when we started the process, and this was most evident in the fact that we didn't even look at the state labor laws before we started this process in terms of what, the stri what a strike requires. So we're lucky that the state of Oregon allows strikes, but there is a pretty serious <laughs> process between the time bargaining starts and certain metrics need to be met along the way before you can strike. Um, which meant that, and we were fighting the summer leave, right? It's very difficult to go on strike in the middle of summer when no one is here. Um, and so we didn't even look at this at the beginning. Um, and to add to the complication, um, it was about nine months into the process when we started thinking that was a serious prospect of going on strike. And our then president had accepted a position at Johns Hopkins for the year. Um, in Baltimore, so he left, and our new president, Joe Henry, who's currently dealing with fires in California, uh, had to step into the negotiation process without the benefit of having been on the team for the first nine months. So it was like very, very hard and complicated. So we spent that summer in mediation and stopped having face-to-face -face meetings with the administration. Um, and by that time, it became very clear that a strike was inevitable, and the problem became that the strike was going to fall legally on the first week of December, which was the last week of classes before finals. It was also cold and rainy. December in Eugene is not exactly a fun time. Um, and I think that the thing that is least well understood by the administration still to this day is that nobody wanted to strike. Like, we were not excited about it. The bargaining team was terrified that it was going to go wrong. Um, we were also just exhausted of 15 months of being involved in this process and like still trying to you know, do your graduate work. And I, I took two comps and passed my um, dissertation prospectus during this time. 
And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be easy. Um, so yeah, it didn't work out that way. So <laughs> we were really, really scared. Um, but this is the point that I have to say the most union-y thing I'm going to say up here. Um, solidarity is what made the strike work. Um, if it hadn't been for the organizing work of the people who came before us, we would not have had certainly the reach that we did. Um, every department on campus striked. Every business school stri went on strike. Physics went on strike. Everybody, like people that you did not expect to go on strike would. We had um, the like young and childless people marching for our pregnant and you know parent, our pregnant uh, workers and our parents, our cousins in UA and SEIU and the Teamsters on campus all supported us like in every possible way, financially, emotionally, with food, um, little hand warmers. Those were really popular. Uh, and I know that I'm eternally grateful to those people. Um, I literally, as I was typing this in the back corner, started tearing up thinking about how tired I was and how grateful I was that people showed up to help us. Um, but I also don't want to make it sound like it was all sunshine and butterflies. Uh, the negotiating team did not sleep or eat and ate nothing but, you know, vending food crap for about eight days. Um, and the members on the front lines were, you know, striking at 5 a.m. and freezing and angry that this was not over yet. Um, they had to be there at 5 a.m. so that certain deliveries couldn't be made. The UPS drivers needed a line that they could say we can't cross. Um, so people were out all day, every day. Heather was out there <laughs> with those guys. Thank you. <laughs> um, and the leadership in the executive council wanted us to make the administration pay for forcing us to do this. Um, and so coming to a solution was really, really difficult and involved a great deal of yelling and crying and not a small number of relationships that were irre irrevocably damaged. And so it was not easy. I would not recommend it as a first strategy, but in the end, <laughs> we did end up with two years of the largest wage increases of any public sector union in the country at the time. <laughs> so proud. <laughs> I was very proud. We actually got a call from Randy Weingarten, who was like, no one is getting these raises. What? Um, and we also got one of those great uh, things that the university fought and fought and fought against and now brags about, which is a completely unique fund for graduate students to be able to access in times of medical need or if they bring a child into their family. Um, and the best part about that was, so we struck in December, we signed the contract like that January, and then in June, the Oregon State Legislature passed mandatory sick time for all employees in Oregon, so they had to give us sick time on top of that awesome fund. <laughs> so, yay! <laughs> so, so proud. Um, yeah, so that was sort of the process of the strike, and I'll leave it there. If you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Haley. I'm a writing graduate student here. I'm kind of in an arts program. Um, I joined the union last year, and I think it's pertinent to include that um, the year before, right out of my undergrad, I had gone to Montana at Missoula and began my studies. Um, and it was all fine, and slowly but surely, I realized that this university was in a financial collapse. Um, there was no union, and Everybody became very miserable, things were lost. Um, they decided to cut our pay in the middle of it all and, and it was just miserable and I had to drop out. Um, tra transferred here, better program, it ended up awesome. But you know, I walked into the union office and, and just sort of realized that, um, you know, dare I say that graduate suffering, suffering is like something that I think they want us to think is very random. And, um, and not something that has to do with anything else, but I saw when I came here, it was directly related to like a business model and the fact that over there, we didn't have a union. So the minute I came here and joined the union, it was like these conversations were already started. We were engaged with the history of labor and um, namely like we were already fighting for when I got here things that, things that one doesn't take account of that are like being lost. But anyway, um, I'm going to begin with a couple of like just basic points of what we're doing now, what we've done since the strike, and then, um, yeah, some other stuff. So in 2016, I have a lot of numbers. I'm going to be reading off of this. 2016, we got an office. Um, we moved from um, another space to our little off-campus office. Um, it's very 
I think that was my, one of my favorite parts about it because you can conceive of the group as something engaged with the university but separate. Um, and also like it's a very like safe space for us to organize like for other for people who might like not feel comfortable having certain like conversations about the way that they're being hurt by the university on campus in that shadow. So yeah, we've moved. Um, it's awesome. Um, yeah. So yeah, and then in 2016 and 17, um, our contract negotiations led to a 3.5, another 3.5, and then a 3.5, a 3.7 percent raise. So we continued to get raises. Um, a thank you to the work that everybody else has set down for that. Um, I think that they agreed it to basically keep giving us raises for inflation, which is great. Although we are going to fight for so much more. <laughs> um, yeah, and obviously I think a focus that's changed as, you know, uh, the United States has changed is inclusivity. Um, I think we organize now left to right, and I will say more on that in a second. Um, our titles changed from graduate teaching fellows to graduate employees. Um, this was in order to, like, conceive of our bargaining union as, as people who aren't just teaching. Um, especially since, like, in many cases, those are people with, like, lower FTEs who are suffering, like, much more um, pain when they're not paid enough. Um, and then otherwise, like, basically the consciousness of that is conceive of yourself as an employee. Um, there's nothing, there's no fellow thing here. We're employees. Um, oh, yeah, in 2016, we got Mike Marchman. Yeah, I love him. <laughs> yeah, like, that was a hard process. <coughs> and it was, it's funny because, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, I walked in and I was like, no, what's going on here? And Mike's like, here's what's going on. Um, <coughs> here's exactly what's going on. I just read about it. Um, get mad. Uh, yeah, and then that leads directly into Janice, obviously. It was good to hit this university and be like, why was I in such pain without a union in Montana? And then Mike and everybody else is like, that's going to be the federal government. Um, so yeah, Janice, uh, um, uh, when you're like, when you're my age, I think it's quite true that like, um, whether intentionally or it's just something that happens, I, I think we're naturally divorced from the history of labor and a lot of other histories that directly affect our lives and the lives of people we work with. So, you know, with everything going on, like, um, on the news, you know, and that's not some abstract thing I'm trying to say, like, people that I know are being directly affected by some of the moves by the federal government right now, but we can get distracted and, like, lose sight of um, what's going on with labor. And so it, it was just, it was good to see that, like, I walked into the union um, and people were already talking about Janice. It was painful, but people were realistically talking about Janice a year ago. We were starting to get ready to lose, um, you know, fair share, basically. And like, as much as I was like, this is a hopeful space, it was, it was like a good thing to see that people were thinking practically when they needed to um, about losing that. Uh, so we've been, the second I walked in, we were already preparing for that. Um, and then I will say what we did about that in a minute. But... Yeah, oh, and at which point we ended with 80% membership last year that we, and a couple people here did like basically ourselves. We had charts, door knocking, the old school stuff, and um, we went out and, and talked to, to, I think, pretty much almost everybody on campus. I mean, uh, I did shifts talking to people. Uh, you find out that people don't even know the union is a thing, or sometimes you get those those resistances about you know joining the team, and it ended up totally fine, eighty percent. Um, and then I think we're down to like seventy eight now, but we're probably going to get that back, and that's just because of people graduating. So yeah, yeah, Janice definitely got us on our toes in a way that I think was really awesome. Um, otherwise. Otherwise, yeah, I think we're working towards a community, to, excuse me, towards intersections of the community that are being affected by the federal government. The federal government is, the, I think, what I'm personally worried about right now. Um, and, yeah, that's all the history that I can 
bit in, but I will now talk about what's, in terms of the history of the union, what we did yesterday. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's not that much of a history. So it, in the past week, and I mean, since May, um, a couple people have been like looking at the contract and then our team has grown to 24 people wide. Um, yeah. So uh, it was funny because we sat in with admin um, during our ground rules negotiation. And I think I was there because, you know, our team is 24 people wide now instead of like six to eight. And uh, I think that they thought we were just bodies in the room. But behind the scenes, everybody on the team is looking with laser focus at a different issue that we need to uh, work for. Um, it's been amazing to see everybody, all 24 of us, we, we meet every Monday night until like late, it's tense, but we are like pulling things out of the air that we didn't even realize um, were like something we needed to address. Um, we're, we're very direct with the membership right now. Everything that we did um, in the bargaining team, which I'm a part of, is, is due to um, what the membership told us they needed. And I think that that's been a really important link that has, in, I can't say revived because I just got here, right? But like, uh, it is good to see that the membership is speaking directly to us. Um, we try to make sure everybody feels heard. Um, we fight for people who um, stand to be and are already heavily oppressed um, whether that's like LGBTQ rights, disability access, et cetera, um, the, whole, the whole nine, the whole gamut. And um, yeah, I just like, we got in there and they were like intimidated and they admitted it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's good to be a part of that. We were, none of us like really slept this week. Um, we presented, if you didn't know and you weren't there maybe even, we presented our initial asks and gave them the initial language yesterday. Um, and yeah, it was a beautiful presentation. The room was packed with the membership. Um, and it was just like, I, I was thinking as I walked here, it felt like Ocean's 24. Like, <laughs> it was awesome. And uh, yeah, even though fair share is going, um, it's good to hear from like this history, but like, I guess the point is where we're at was we're fighting, we're very aware. Nothing is getting past us. Um, I'm very thankful that you know people were looking really closely at, at Janice as well as all the other things that are happening. Our union is asking for um, anti-ice protection, um, like so much more that directly affects you know trans people who were, it was just said that we're trying to be erased from the from very definition. Um, and then everything we've mentioned to your parents, and, and of course, wages. Um, yeah. And, and oh, and we're also aiming for some universal summer funding. Yeah. Nice. Basically, I guess the thesis of this is, is we are very on it. We're on it, it feels great. Um, it is, it's scary, it is, of course, um, to think about the way that Janice is gonna impact us, and also um, not to say that well, we don't know, right? We don't know if a strike is gonna be on the horizon or not, but those are two directions in which it's scary. But like, like you just said, solidarity is working. Um, it's working well and, uh, you know, I guess I'll, I'll end with, um, it feels like sometimes, as somebody my age, as somebody a little bit divorced from, from the history of these things, it just, it feels like in a time when the powers that be, which do intend, I think, to hide who they are. You know, they're real people trying to take. Um, but, you know, amidst that confusion, that loneliness, that I think th those powers that be want us to feel. Um, it's been awesome to look around and refuse to feel that way. Um, the fight is alive. Um, I'm not going to be confused as I go through this. And then my last points were like, yeah, amidst confusion, we're looking left and right. Who's next to us? Uh, and we're just taking hands and like continuing this fight. Pretty strong, I, I, if I do say so myself. So yeah, thank you. Okay, we're going to have um, 
time for questions, and I'll invite questions both for our panel, but also for the uh, previous panel as well, if you have other questions uh, for the founders. I did want to take a moment um, to recognize um, some folks from the mid-1990s who were kind of present uh, when the change happened uh, from a kind of moribund business model, um, GTFF, to making that transition to the organizing model. And so I'll recognize John Silverman back there, who was a staff organizer for the GTFF in the mid-90s. And Alan Moore, who was a former president of the GTFF then and started uh, really kind of making the turn in the union. Um, did either of you want to mention something or say something before? Uh, yeah, just real, just real quick. Um, unfortunately, the connection between what the founders did and the modern union, there isn't that much other than the contract and the name of the artist. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, what was the name of the artist in the 80s and the early 90s? Very much a mushroom board. We were kept in the dark and bullshit was piled, piled on top of us. And somehow we coalesced, and it, it's, it's talked about on page 13 of the history uh, in a kind of interesting way. Um, we took charge of the union. I became president in, a, in the executive board meeting. My good friend Bob Roberts, who's an Australian, who I still like, resigned, and I became president. I still like him despite that. Um, we had 100% staff turnover. We hired John as our first organizer. You guys still have organizers, right? Now, that was a time when we flipped from the union staff doing everything to we said we are going to take charge of our own union and we're going to have a staff person to help us organize, um, but we're going to do everything else ourselves. And so we 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 act we wouldn't let John or any other staff person come to bargaining or any of the meetings with the university. It was completely focused on either running the benefit program and at that time. It was a union-only trust, and so we, we just took their money and we did what we wanted with our, the, their money. Um, and, um, and a lot of stuff David talked about actually started, in, uh, about half of it started in the mid-90s, the Agile conferences and the, the larger one, the name of the larger coalition, I forget, the International. Coalition of Graduate Employees. Yeah, Coalition of Graduate Employees was, was with Canadians as well, and we decided we couldn't catch up to Michigan, but we could beat Wisconsin. <laughs> and we got um, the member when I became president. Our membership was low fifties, and we got it up. I can't remember the number, close to eighty. And so the stuff that that David talked about, that's when it started. I'd say that's the. It really, it's really been gratifying to me to watch GTFF um, in the interviewing period, um, knowing that I think we made some really smart reforms to the union that you guys have kept, and then you've just done really amazing things from there. And um, what you guys have done since then is what we dreamed would happen. Um, and we, I think we can take credit for setting it in motion, resetting it in motion after our founders set it in motion. We reset it in motion. Um, and for example, uh, in 1995, the, pub, the, uh, the bargaining law was changed to allow open bargaining and allow the members in the room. Most unions in the state thought that bar those bargaining changes were a disaster. For us, we said, we can bring our members and so we started doing what you guys did yesterday. It's filled the room full of rowdy graduate employees who we would ask to maintain decorum. Of course, they wouldn't, which, which we knew they wouldn't. Um, we didn't want them to, even though we said, told them to. And, um, and we started disrupting the power relationship between us and the, 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 uh, the university, which had, despite the great efforts of the founders, had gotten to a point of we had very little power, and they had a lot. And we, started to take the power back and you know I think what we've heard and what we've seen since then is the GTFF has the power and um, onward. Um, I'm pleased to see the union as strong as it is now and, and, that, and that's satisfying. Um, I was originally involved with the union back in 77, 78, 79 when I was in graduate school. Um, and after I graduated, I had a number of jobs. I did a lot of community organizing. Um, I was not employed at the time I saw the ad and said, oh, this might be interesting. So it was a half-time position. And when I came into that job, there were two other staff people. We had a benefits uh, person and an office. We, we, the union hired an office administrator. 
Um, I believe we had three stewards. Um, uh, I put together a stewards packet, which I happen to have a copy here, and I've showed it to some people that and they say, oh, this looks familiar. <laughs> so um, we, uh, I remember going to a meeting in uh, Madison, another one in Gainesville, and meeting other organizers from the other graduate unions, and we liberally borrowed from each other. Um, and a lot of the stuff that got put in here came from, from that source, as well as Labor Education Resource Center. You know, real basic stuff about the duty of fair representation, the right to information, um, the need to just basically educate a bunch of graduate students about what does it mean to be in a union, let alone what does it mean to be a union steward. Um, we got a lot of, that, that was the focus when I was hired. Um, we were very much aware of the fact that folks came to our office for the health insurance. Um, I worked half time. It's kind of hard to be there and also go out and uh, be asked to speak to departments and meetings and things like that. Um, the my experience there, and I'm not sure, do you still have a staff union? Okay. <laughs> so the three of us were in a staff union. And my experience there, the, the board, the, the folks who were running the union when I got hired, three years later, they were all gone. All new people. Um, people who didn't see, have a conception of where things were before I was hired, just saw where things were at that th th third year point. And they came in with a lot of ideas about, I should be doing my job differently. They needed an education about what it meant to be an employer who had a contract with a union. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm fine to go mention a little more about this, but I want to make sure that's okay with the union president now <laughs> because uh, I have an agreement with the union that I don't talk about this. So, um, okay. <laughs> so I actually filed, an, uh, our staff union actually filed an unfair labor complaint against the GTFF. Um, for not following the procedures in the union contract. And um, uh, we didn't have job descriptions. Um, you know, so basically um, we negotiated a, an agreement, a settlement. I left the union and things moved on. I'm glad to think that it, that it worked out. But that bit about Understanding what it means to be an employer um, was something that this union needed to learn. And, um, and I think that's very important for the current union leadership to keep that in mind. That, that it's not simply to say, we think you should be doing something completely different than what you've been doing and not follow the same processes and not treating your employees the same way that you would expect your employer to treat your union members. And that, that was a real critical thing. And that lack of institutional knowledge over time. Um, uh, I think that's a real challenge in any, and I've seen this in other organizations, a lot of membership driven nonprofits, this is this, uh, this is this is situation. I mean, I'm with the Oregon Country Fair and that's, the board gets changed all the time. <laughs> And people don't come in with new, without that institutional knowledge. And I think that's, going, that's a real critical thing that is important, is that somehow that that be maintained so that the people who are coming in understand how things got to where they were. Um, but I'm happy to share this with folks if you want to take a look at it. Um, and, um, and again, I, I'm, I'm real appreciative that the union is as strong as it is now. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So we have some time for questions, so um, 
we'll start with Paul and then. Good. Um, John isn't the only one who, who left the, uh, the union unceremoniously. I have my own story. So um, basically that time period that John is talking about was really contentious. And I remember being on the board at that time and climbing up the ass, for the use of a better term, of, of every president before me, before I became president. And so everybody had this sort of idea about moving to this, this organizing model and kind of pushing that. And we all sort of were at each other's throats about how do we approach this and how do we do this? And so I challenged those, those previous presidents and then I became president, and then I realized what their sort of circumstances were being in that position. And so we kind of oversaw that transition, and this is where we had these really difficult insurance negotiations. And so on that uh, insurance negotiation team, I basically, pushing the organizing model and the membership model, basically browbeat my team into we are not moving. And I just said, we are not going anywhere financially. We can cave on some other things. We're not moving financially. And so I, I really strong-armed these other people in saying, we are not doing anything. And I'm like, this is not very member-driven. And I also remember during those negotiations, um, making decisions about communicating with media. And so I worked with an organizer. But it was basically me, the organizer, and a few other folks that are on a negotiating team who are trying to organize this media campaign and all these other things to get these negotiations to go through. And so again, it's during the summer. There's not a lot of members there. And I'm thinking to myself, OK, I'm pushing this membership model. But at the same time, I'm doing everything top down. And so there's this transition happening. We go to one of these agile meetings. Something happened at one of those meetings. The president didn't like what I said. I was talking on behalf of the CGE in Corvallis, assumed I was talking about the GTFF. And things ensued. And then my friend comes to me with a piece of paper that says, um, here, you've done all these things. And I looked at my friend. I go, none of this is true. And she kind of just stares at me. And so I looked at her. And I said, if I sign this piece of paper, can the board move forward with this membership model? And she goes, yes. And so I happily signed this thing. I don't know if it's still there through after all these moves, but there's this piece of paper that says, Paul Prue did all this stuff. Um, I don't think I did. <laughs> but it was one of those things where we all have these disagreements about how do we move forward? How do we push this thing forward? And so during that transitory period, things were really incredibly contentious. Um, on those boards. And so I think once Chris got there, he kind of inherited sort of this new model and then you're able to move forward. And I think that was the positive thing that I saw with that is that I will happily sign this piece of paper. I will happily walk away from the union and not really actively participate if you all can move forward with this membership model. And so that was a real challenge to me intellectually to deal with the fact that the way I acted was exactly opposite of what I was pushing for in that, to get this done. And that still kind of resonates with me about how we do this. And so I'm glad to see that, you know, basically how you're operating now is what we wanted to do, but that was an incredibly messy process when John was there and when I was there. And I recall I was, I was the mediator, or I was the one who mediated that, that kind of conclusion to that. And so that was a really difficult period in our history. Um, for us and for those who are involved. And I remember after I was president going to one of the former president's houses and having some port and drinking kind of basically in like, oh my God, we all went through this, right? And, and, and survive that during, during that particular time period. And hopefully you don't have to do that when you <laughs> kind of move out of the presidency anymore, but that's kind of that period. Um, and so it was incredibly messy and challenging. So I came into the GTFF. My very first term was I was told by my stewards, one of whom was Shauna, uh, also Jess Kanifi, other former president in political science. We have a whole sociology and poli-sci, or you know, we all know the big ones. But I was told my first term, hey, by the way, we're striking, so like, don't go to work uh, during your first couple weeks here, uh, which was great. And I was like, super. Uh, let me. Where do I sign up? So. Uh, I wasn't there for the lead up to the strike. I was there on the very tail end of it. I was very happy to participate in the strike and do what I could. Uh, but Sean, from what I understand, 
a big thing that led to the strike was not just there was a disagreement about you know how much money they ought to give us. It was, in fact, how they were treating the bargaining team and the membership and what their bargaining team looked like uh, and how the university decided to handle their composition, let's say, of their bargaining team. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that just to give us some more context. Sure, yeah. So it was pretty clear from the beginning they had absolutely no respect for us whatsoever. Um, and one of the things we like to talk about um, their bargaining team got to show up when they felt like it, and there was one particular member who I will not name, but he would show up occasionally and spend the entire, I'm not even exaggerating, he would spend the entire session like this. Like, you know, we're sitting there telling our stories, trying to explain why we need something, and there's a guy literally taking a nap across the table from us. Um, and every time we would bring up any, you know, sort of tug at your heart story, like this is, here is a person who has been through something real and is sharing it publicly and not easy to do, they would go, well, I don't really understand how that's relevant. It's like, well, I'm telling you why I need a raise or why when I, this one story that I keep bringing up, you know, why when I literally had a child, I had to go to work 48 hours later and I was not recovered. <laughs> And they just did not care. Um, and that was very apparent throughout the entire process. Um, so yeah, so that was a large part of, <laughs> of why we ended up going on strike. But also I would say that, again, just going back to the organizing and how vital it was, we never had a room, like this room would have been fire code problematic. Like we never had a room that didn't have, you know, at least 100 people in it. We ended up, I don't know if you guys remember old school EMU. There was this really creepy room that had like silhouettes on the back wall. The Ben Linder uh, room. Yeah, the Ben Linder room. We were in there and it's, you know, it's fishbowl style and it's kind of creepy. There's some really ugly pictures of me from back then and, you know, from the back. Um, but th we made it so that we faced the wall and they had to face our people. Because um, we were like, no, this is like, look at the people that you are telling are basically worthless. Um, and they did that over and over and over again. And that's, I mean, again, we always were looking for a way to settle, but they were refusing to give us even cost of living wage, wage increases. And we were like, that's insane. We make nothing and we need to survive. And so we ended up, even during the strike, that was a continual attitudinal problem that the, their lead negotiator regularly like rolled his eyes at us, like, you guys aren't serious. And I'm like, have you noticed the like, people on, out on strike? and? Again, thank God for our membership showing up and all of our friends. And I, I forgot to mention, of course, our parent, AFT Oregon, that came down and supported us so much with physical resources and people um, that if, you know, finally it took eight days of them going, we can't have another day. And we were going into finals week and they were terrified that we were not going to be there to proctor exams <laughs> or grade them. Um, so and we and so that was what ended up winning the strike for us was that they finally had to take us seriously in the end. Um, and I will say the next negotiating cycle was f like they came in with a completely different attitude. I was the chair of that particular negotiating cycle team, our uh, bargaining team, and they came in with a completely different attitude. They treated us well from start to finish, um, and with a lot, lot, lot more respect. Still didn't get everything we wanted, but a lot more respect throughout the whole process, and I think that was an absolute result of the strike, so. Uh, just uh, two thoughts about the strike. It was wonderful. Um, uh, and those a lot of crying. Yeah, you were very happy to be supportive, and yeah, it, was, it was helpful to us later in terms of our budget. Um, but uh, two thoughts. One, I thought that was an excellent alliance that you made was with the faculty mm -hmm. because, as you said, it was during the grading week uh, that the strike occurred. And there became a very big issue within the university center amongst the faculty about who's going to do the grading. Mm -hmm. And are we going to let the uh, GTFs, who are actually running the various classes, um, be the ones who grade? Um, or are we going to have responsibility for grading signed up with others, send it past legislation? So I think that mm -hmm. was very good. Um, and the other thing is, um, this was also just around the time when um, the state created boards of trustees mm -hmm. uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the various uh, campuses. And I was fortunate to be the uh, classified member on our board yes. here. And uh, I can recall having conversations with the administration saying, listen to the GTFs. 
They don't want to strike. They want to settle. And even the, the I don't know who was the line or who was the really the the, the, uh, uh, the their uh, position, but it was clear. Absolutely not. Those graduate teaching fellows are crazy. They want to go out and they want to strike. They want to shut down the mm -hmm. university. We can't compromise. And it's like, I don't know if you were had that sort of, but that was clearly the message uh, behind the scenes. Yeah. It was received. We got that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm cognizant that we're pushing up against the uh, end of the session. So we can take one or two more questions and then we'll have to break for lunch so we have time to get back. So. Well, I have a question relating to the Janus decision that now you're faced with issues of recruitment and retention and how are you going to do that? And my question is for Libby. What are you doing and how are you doing it to communicate your whims to the campus community, to potential members, to current members? Um, I'll let uh, Yeah, sure. So that's a great question. Uh, we were pretty, we had a lot of anxiety about what Janice would mean coming into the school year, right? Because as we all know, one of the structural uh, uh, problems, let's say, or difficulty with a grad is that you lose 20, 25% membership each year and have to do recruitment. So we were really, we had a lot of trepidation coming into this fall. You know, would the things we had done before be enough to get people to sign up? And it's a lot harder ask uh, to say you uh, charge 35 or $40 a month versus five extra dollars to a fair share of full member. Uh, and it, when we lost that argument, it became apparent just how much of a crutch that argument had become for us. To say, oh, it's only five bucks a month, just sign your card. Five extra dollars a month. So we really had to go back to basics and communicate wins as you put in and describe to people and convince them why the union is valuable. Uh, and I think we did that and we ended up uh, recruiting, the number might be a little off, but about 75% of the incoming cohort uh, still signed the union card, which is on par, if not more than in previous years. So what we were, our concern, our anxiety was ultimately unfounded, but that's because we put in a lot of organizing efforts. Uh, terms of the orientation week, we have in our contract now a, a guaranteed at least half hour at the orientation for all grad students, that's just for the union. Uh, we have a little week where we're trying to make a better this time language about department level orientations. And in terms of how to communicate our wins, it's something we're still working on. But one thing we've done is revise our newsletters. Mm -hmm. So in previous years, they were print. And young people like myself don't look at printed things anymore. <laughs> right? We look at things on computer screens, on our phones, and everything else. So we've really revised how we've done our newsletter, done our communication strategy. Where every two weeks now, all of our members expect to see a newsletter in their email. We have about 60 to 70% open rates on that email, and we have great metrics to see how people are scrolling through. Uh, and then part of that newsletter now is, what have we won since the last newsletter? Right? Small, minor things. Or what have, what's the union been up to? And I think that's been really effective. So for example, with Ricardo, our current grievance officer wins a grievance or helps somebody, we ask that person they helped to write a small statement to put the news on them. Like, I got this because of the union, for example. Or there was this social event, and we have a picture from the event to the news on So that's been really effective. Um, but as we go further into bargaining, I think we're going to have to do even more of that uh, and really think carefully about how to do that. So uh, I guess the short story is Janice, because of the organizing efforts, has not been a and luckily, um, luckily, I think, I mean, I don't actually know. It seemed to me like at times the, the general membership might have been like more like, thanks for doing that, you know, bye. But yeah, with our GMMs, we had two before we began no negotiations, an extra one, as it were. And we packed um, a high school cafeteria. Like, it's, it is about keeping the general membership aware. And then also, like, although, like, argumentative crutches suck, our, the inflation raises that we won in 2015 and 2016 actually. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, right. Excuse me, excuse me. But it covers the, the fee. Like, so we keep getting a raise that actually covers the fee that it would be to join. And it's just kind of, like, making people aware of, like, you know, you're 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 gaining more, you know, because I think that people don't realize what they stand to lose. But anyway, yeah, I, I wanted to just echo Mike, and then I regretted during my 
panel not thanking Mike. Um, so can I have a round of applause for the current president? Yeah, he's great. He's a comedian. Um, he's, he's really good at sewing everybody together. So thanks, Mike. Final question from Bill. Yes, uh, thank you for the panelists. Uh, I think we all learned a lot and, and uh, it was very enriching to, to hear uh, what happened afterwards. Uh, and, uh, so my question, Rick, it's sort of two parts, but very quickly. Uh, Shina's comments about the strike, uh, fear and agonizing, and how you do it, and so forth. Uh, and I wanted to invite Jerry Limke to come back on a little reflection in history with that first non-strike in 1978, and how those sort of reflect each other in a way. And the second part of the question is, I, you've partly answered it, I think, and yesterday's bargaining session showed what the future looks like, but if any panelists want to comment on how you see the future, five, 10, or 20 or 40 years from now. So two parts of the question, if we have time, thank you. I can handle the second part if someone takes the first part. Well. <laughs> I wasn't listening to what Bill said, <laughs> but but I but I think I, I, in the in that first uh, first panel, there were a couple of comments about the the two thirds uh, vote vote that it took to to have a strike, and. Um, and I, I, I wrote that. <laughs> I, I wrote the bylaws, and 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 I wrote that into the into the bylaws. And here's why I did it. Um, um, even though I was a sociology graduate student, um, I I was sometimes uh, masquerading as a historian, labor historian, and I knew from the past that when new unions are formed, right. One of the things that management often wants is a strike because they know that it's going to divide the membership of the union. There are going to be people who are really going to suffer from the strike and, and they're going to turn that anger against the union. And so I was, I was scared to death that, uh, and this was, you know, in the 1970s, we're still on the, on the tail end of of radical anti-war uh, stuff, and I was really afraid that uh, we would get a, a premature strike, um, and we better set the bar, the bar high, so that if, if we get a two-thirds vote, <laughs> right, we're, we're pretty likely to win the strike. And something short of that, um, maybe not. Now, what, what we know is that the union survived. <laughs> Two strike votes went down, but the union survived. We don't know what would have happened if that had been a 50 percent vote. Mm -hmm. We'd have gone out on strike. I'm, I don't know. We don't know. We'll never know about that. But that's 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 where that came from, and that's why that's why I did it. So, so is that what you wanted? I'm I'm actually very grateful for that because when we went on strike we spent a lot, a lot of time making sure everybody was on our side. And I, I can't remember exactly, there's a piece of paper somewhere in the office that says, and I wanna say it was something like an 87% vote to go on strike. Um, it was very, it was you. Okay. <laughs> I can't remember the number. It was a lot. It's on a piece of paper there. But it was it was like a a very very large percentage that voted to go on strike. So yeah. So I'll just uh, fill in that last comment about what does the future look like. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to go around the country talking to all sorts of union members, um, not just in higher ed, but now I also focus a lot with um, our K-12 members and PSRPs and whatnot. Um, I will very quickly introduce my colleague over there, Jessica Foster, who is an AFT national rep. So. <laughs> And hopefully, she, I, I think she would echo the things. But the things that I'm seeing right now in the labor movement are very incredible. I've never, you know, the moment of being attacked has actually turned people 
into incredibly active members. And I'm seeing member engagement now that I've never seen before. And this is going back two or three years of preparation because before we had Janice, we had Friedrichs um, and people got it. And then on top of that, this current political moment that we're in, I think everyone understands the purpose of collective action and that unions in this country are the foundation of social change in this country. Like it can't be done without the labor movement. Um, and I love all of our sister movements, the environmental movement, all these other ones, but really the bedrock of progressive change in this country is the labor movement. And I'm very hopeful that even though right now it sucks, um, we're living through horrible times. I've never seen people like stepping up in ways, um, in big and small ways, taking leadership roles, but you know, showing up in meetings, you know, just being an engaged member. And so I'm very hopeful now that, you know, what's going on is actually, it's another transformative moment uh, for the labor movement. And it's a real honor to be able to work for committed union members like y'all, um, to be able to see social change like this and to think that, you know, we're at the beginning of something new and beautiful. And so I'm very hopeful. <laughs> so.